network forensics. So network forensics, we're going to talk about the basics of inter-networking from one computer to the other. The thing that a lot of people don't get when they first start out is the data is data. It doesn't matter if it's going through the network or if it's physically on a system. And through some of the uh, labs or some of the demos, we'll go through actually carving out data. Not only right off the hard disk in raw data format, but also good old uh, through network uh, using a Wireshark and another tool called Network Miner. So we're going to understand some of the basic internet fundamentals, uh, network basics, and of course, network forensics. But again, the biggest thing to keep in mind with the network forensics is data is data. It's nothing more than a data container, but when it goes over a network, it's just broken up into smaller pieces. So putting those pieces together, and especially if it's an attack or whatnot, is going to be part of the forensics portion. So the internet, you just need to know it's just a collection of a bunch of other networks, other computers. Um, if it's an outside attack, some of the problems that you may come across primarily is just going to be jurisdictional. For example, if you own all the computers, if somebody was trying to spoof an attack from point A to point B and you owned all of the routers, all the firewalls, switches, all the computers and whatnot in the network, you could actually trace down every single spoofed packet to the switch and then follow the switch on the port. Uh, and then follow that port down with the cable connected to it and then find out the exact computer that sent out the spoofed content. So everything is a fingerprint. Um, if you control everything, you can then prove everything at that point. It just comes down to logging. The unfortunate part about the internet is you're not going to control everything, you don't own everything. So if somebody from a foreign country comes in and attacks you, it comes down to getting the log content, you're, there's a good possibility you may not be able to get access to it or it may be too expensive or cost prohibitive. So that's why a lot of organizations, when they do the uh, investigation, they'll go all the way to where, yes, this IP address did the attack, we're just gonna block it, we're not gonna pursue criminal uh, actions against the organization, against the individual owner of the IP, and so forth. Again, some of the other tools, uh, protocols that are relatively common in the internet would be email, web browsers, things in that aspect. ISP is the term that gets thrown out quite a bit. ISP is just your internet service provider. Um, with that being said, they're the ones that give you the um, broadband, the access, usually the, what's called a routable IP, and a routable IP is an IP address or um, an identifier for the network or the computer itself that other computers on the internet can also communicate with. The registry inside of Microsoft Windows is basically the brain of the operating system. If you have any sort of Microsoft um, application, a lot of times you're going to store some of the key information inside the registry. For example, Internet Explorer. Um, unlike any of the other browsers, it uses the registry for most of the content. For example, one great key is going to be the H key current users for the specific user which you're looking at, or it's also going to be the entuser.dat file if you're looking directly at the registry file. Under Software, Microsoft, Internet Explorer, and then space typed URLs. That's going to have every URL that was typed in Internet Explorer, and if you press the Go button or if you hit Enter, th that's the information that's going to be put in there. So a lot of the applications that look at browser history, specifically with Internet Explorer, that's all they're going to is that specific key. There's other items in there, especially um, if you're dealing with, instead of Internet Explorer, just Explorer. So I'm going to go down to Windows, current version, and then there's a program in here called Explorer, and that's for Windows Explorer. So there's this specific key called ComDL32. So if you go to H key current user, which is that ntuser.dat file in the user's profile, software slash Microsoft slash Windows slash current version slash Explorer slash ComDLG32. What's great about this specific key is it'll have things such as um, open saved. Open saved is a specific thing that if they save the file or if they save as the file, it will also dump it into the registry. So for example, I'm going to find an EO1 file. These EO1 files are going to be those end case images. It's going to have the last um, 9 to 99, depending on how the registry is set up, files that you touched. So again, if they saved it, it's going to be in here. So I'm going to double click on zero. And this specific one is going to be in course files, images, and it's hacking case 
Okay, this right here, the uh, Dell Latitude CPI E01 file. What's nice about this is even if they delete the files, the registry key is still going to be there. So for example, if it's an inappropriate use case, if you can find it under the GIFs or the JPEGs, things in that aspect, if they're downloading things they shouldn't be downloading, if it's in here, they actually did save it. Nine times out of ten, yes, this information can potentially be put in there by malicious hands to make somebody look bad, but when it comes down to it, nine times out of ten, that's not going to be the case. The uh, sophistication of the suspect versus the sophistication of the people that quote unquote want to frame the person. So when it comes down to it, whenever they do file save or save as, it gets dumped into here. So if they go to, for example, again, a website, they download things that they shouldn't, they claim that it was an accidental download. If it's in here, it was not an accidental download. 